pray and we're going to get into Genesis. I didn't even bring a Bible. We have to get a Bible here before we keep going. But Father, we are grateful for this evening. Thank you for those who've come and who want to think deeply. And we pray that you would give them something great today. Um, a lot of this stuff is, we're all just kind of mulling about and thinking about. So help us together to grow closer to one another, to you, and help us to understand your word a little better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go. Um, you hopefully have your notes. I have, let's see here, some notes here. We'll just put up on the Facebook page like 20 minutes ago at Fly. If you want, if you need to go get them. Yeah, I mean, that means you all are slackers if you didn't get that in the last 20 minutes. Wow. I, I literally just finished this. And honestly, I have another 10 pages that I wrote, which are not on here because I just couldn't finish it in time. So, but it's just a bunch of verses anyway. So if we get to it, we get to it. If we don't, like we probably won't, I'll just skip it. It's just the Bible after all. It's not that big a deal. Um, all right. So, let, oh, thanks, an NIV, good. I don't know, yeah. yeah, my eyes are gonna have to get a whole lot different. If I'm gonna okay, start use, using this one. No, no, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's start with some definitions here. I titled this one, Protology and Eschatology, Heaven and Hell, Life and Death. I should probably say, oh my, All right? So we're talking about protology and eschatology. Everybody knows what eschatology is. Eschatology is all that stuff that you don't want to deal with, right? You don't want to talk about because it's that end time stuff. It's when the dragon is seven years and tribulation and rapture and millennium and uh, just right that mess of stuff that happens in Revelation. Eschatology, that means the study of last things, right? Protology, what's protology? The beginning. Good. Study of the beginning, right? And by the way, if you write protology into your computers, it will almost always spell check it and say it'll it'll fix it'll fix it to proctology. So this is not a conversation about proctology and eschatology. This is just protology and eschatology. Hey, how are you? So we got here. Uh, let me give you here's some more notes. There you go. Apologize for being late. You're fine. Almost everybody's coming late. That's what, that's what happens. Okay, so um, that this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this eschatological thing that's happening later in life, or at least according to Paul, what's happening later in life. So where do we get our idea? I'm sorry. According to Paul, is talking about later than the cross, but we're going to get to all that in just a second. So where do we get our ideas about what's happening in the end? Where does this come from? You're welcome to participate if you want. Where does it usually happen? Revelation, I heard. Mm -hmm. Childhood upbringing, kind of what you're taught in your childhood <laughs> upbringing. Absolutely, whatever your parents told you, or grandparents, or school. school if you, especially if you're to a Christian school, they'll talk to you about that kind of stuff. James Cameron. James Cameron. Wait, what did James Cameron do? I don't know. The Left Behind series. Kirk, James, Kirk, Kirk, Cameron. Cameron. Kirk Cameron. Oh, Kirk Cameron Kirk is what Cameron. you're going for. Kirk Cameron. Yeah. All right. Yes. Kirk Cameron. He tells he, he is the one who instructs us on what we're supposed to think about the end times. Absolutely. All right. So if you uh, grew up, when I grew up, as I'm looking around here, I'm seeing that, yeah, there's a few people that did. Um, let's see here. John is before me. Michelle is about my age. Brad, you got, you got another 10 years on me. Um, on Facebook. Yeah, Laura, you're about my age. So, so if you had any time in the 70s, you probably, you probably were forced to watch The Thief in the Night. Did anybody watch The Thief in the Night? Only Hannah. Okay, well, I can't see half the people on the screen, so I'm sure there are more. Um, but yeah, Thief, on the, Thief in the Night scared the heck out of me when I was probably 10 years old. Uh, they, they, they brought the, the people who would not recant Jesus. They brought him outside of the church and there was this huge guillotine there. And they basically just took turns chopping each other's heads off. It was, I mean, yeah, it was terrible. Um, but for the more recent time, right. Left behind, that's the Kirk Cameron stuff that Travis was talking about. 
Um, so you got books, you've got, um, you got videos, all of that's happening. And most recently, come on in, hey, have a seat. What's up? Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you guys. Nice. Oh, sorry, I got nowhere to put all my stuff. If you're online and don't want to unmute yourself and have a question, just put it in the chat and I'll interrupt. Yep. The people in the room can ask questions and you don't have to, I mean, you get priority over this Zoom stuff, but I'm looking at them because there's uh, a bunch of people on here. So um, we got some Bibles if you guys want them. We're probably, we're talking big picture. So by the way, today is kind of like, we're going to go back and look at Genesis one through three and connect it to the future is kind of what's going on. Next week, I'm planning on bringing in Dr. Dalrymple and we're gonna have a conversation about the animals and the true son of man and take that also into the book of Revelation where he's an expert in Daniel. So I'm basically gonna have a conversation with him in front of all of you and you guys can ask questions too, but I've got a bunch of questions that I wanna ask him. So you'll have to somehow beat me out in asking questions. So anyway, um, all right. So protology and eschatology is what we're talking about. Beginning of things and the end of things. These are the two big theological things. And we said we get our ideas from all over the place, from our parents, from church, from books that we read, from videos that we got scared about when we were younger, whatever this means. So what we would like to do, instead of trying to figure out what it is that's in all the theology and stuff like, we'd actually like to read the Bible here today. And the Bible will do something amazing. Basically, it will mess with all of your theology. So if you actually read the Bible, instead of read your theology, you will be blown away as to what's going on in the text. And hopefully I've been showing you that over the last eight weeks or so, that the text is actually doing something considerably different than what we want it to do. We have all these questions and it doesn't care about those answers. So you're gonna ask questions about, for instance, heaven and hell. Okay. It, the Bible generally doesn't care about such things. So it might throw out a few ideas here and there. Jesus will say, oh, and this time I will be with you in paradise, right? And then you're just like, hey, hey, Jesus, could you give me some more information on that? Hey, no, dude, I'm on the cross right now. There's no more information. Just I'll be with you in paradise and we're done, right? And we're like, no, we need more information. That's all we get. Right? We don't know what paradise means. I mean, we know what the word means. It just means garden, but we don't know what's happening with this. And that's it's those kinds of things. So we put our little system around things and we never actually get to see what the Bible, what the story is trying to get across to us. So our job is to submit to the Bible, not really to the Bible. We're trying to submit to God, but God has inspired this for us to hear. So we want to actually try and figure out what the Bible is doing. So we have this idea in our head about the way things work. That is, we know that if we just travel the Romans road, right, that we're sinful um, and that, uh, you know, that God's punishment for us because of our sin, the wages of sin is death. We just travel through chapter three, chapter six. We work our way through chapter seven, right, in Romans road. And then we come up with this gospel idea. We have this idea that one sometime in our life, we're just traveling down this path. And then there is this moment in life when we're met with the password kind of moment the you know if you want the ticket you can have the ticket if you don't you don't have it like here's your choice make your choice and of course that means for most of us you know when we're six years old we sit down on the uh, we kneel down before our bed and we say our sinner's prayer right the so-called sinner's prayer that everybody has to pray in fact it's so huge even even still like i i get asked that question all the time in interviews when did you meet Jesus? Tell us your testimony, your life experience here of when you met him. And really what they mean is tell me the day on January 7th, 1974, when you said a prayer where you invited Jesus into your life. Okay. And none of those concepts are in scripture, but we, we kind of, we're, they're in our heads. So we feel like we have to do them. So, and whatever this decision is that we make is going to determine the rest of our life, right? Sinner's prayer, baptism, Romans road, some kind of ritual and everything in our life depends on that. And that's why we're doing it. We're doing this moment in order to get into whatever thing after we die. Right. That's our goal. We want to get past this life into the next life. Everything's about that. 
So if you did the right thing in that moment, then you get to live in some otherworldly, ethereal, cloud-like setting with harps that you get to play on and <laughs> sing and forever and ever sing, oh, come all you faithful, or I come to the garden alone, or whatever your particular um, favorite hymn is, you get to sing that one forever and ever. So the problem is that we have this concept in our head, and then we go out and we evangelize people with this kind of concept. And they want to shoot themselves like this is the this sounds like the worst possible thing that we can imagine. I'm going to slit on a cloud and sing songs and but none of this is in the Bible. So our evangelism tactics are all wrong. We're just completely thinking about things wrong or even worse. We do this. We say, if you don't get this magic ticket. Right. What's going to happen to you? Turn or burn. Turn or burn. Right. No, no, this conscious and who? Who wants to do that? I mean, like, oh, I'm in. Like, I don't want to burn. So I, let's turn, I'll do what I've got to do. So what we want to do is drop this traditional view, set it aside, at least for today, right? You can come back to the traditional view if you like it. But for tonight, we're going to drop, drop it and we're going to go forward with a, um, with a biblical view. Instead of the traditional view, we'll go with a biblical view. I saw that my son said something, but I don't know what it was. So This sounds like the Sith mentality. Huh. Yeah, may the fourth be with you there, Caden. Thank you. Uh, that was Caden, right? I don't know which yes. one that was. I just saw somebody. Okay, I didn't even know he was on here. We've got, on we've got all the Broadhurst now. We got all the Broadhurst. All my sons are here. Hey guys, nice to see you. Yeah, I don't see anybody. I see Riston at least. That's nice. All right. Okay, so here's here's we're starting back at the beginning, right? This is what Ken Ham always tells us to do, and we're going to obey Ken Ham this time. We usually don't do anything Ken Ham says, but we're going to go back today and we're going to obey him and we're going to go back to Genesis. Right there in verse one, it tells us in the beginning, God did what? Created the... Created the heavens and the earth. Good job. It's like you guys in here can be louder. The heavens and the earth. So by the way, not heaven and hell, right? So the opposite of heaven is earth, not hell. But we kind of bring that into this, and it's fine. We can bring it in because the word hell shows up throughout scripture, so it's okay. But heaven and earth are the two concepts that we want to really grab hold of. And right here in the beginning, God makes for us this place where he can dwell, right? I have so many people in here. I feel like I should be using the uh, actual whiteboard because no one else is going to be able to see. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, will you? Yeah. And I'll start. I'll start on here. And you erase that. So, all right. So here's what we've got for those of you on Zoom. That's why you people on Facebook Live should go on Zoom because you can see this a little bit better. But um, so, so quick, God quick, is making, sorry, quick, what Travis? Quick interruption. If you're on a desktop and you want to see Jace and the share screen, if you go to your view options and go down to side-by-side -side mode, it'll show both. FYI, it's a thing we were trying to play with to get better, but. It only works on a desktop, I think. I don't think it works on mobile. How interesting. Okay. All right. So God comes down, or God God is where he is. There's no down. There's no up. Remember that kind of stuff, right? So God is who he is, and he creates man. Okay? This is my perfect representation of man. Okay? And man has a journey to take. He's, he has a job to do. He has a vocation. He's tasked with something. And he's given this vocation in a place called Eden, right? Specifically in a garden in Eden. So creation itself, we've said, is God's place and man's place. And they're in the middle, right? This is where God and man dwell. So there are two realms that God dwells in, earth and heaven, right? This is very important to this whole concept of what's happening in eschatology, what's happening at the end of time. So, and he creates man on a mountain called Eden. Okay, we did all this. Those of you who haven't been here before, um, this is old information and my, my stylus is not working really well. Um, so, okay. So Eden is on this mountain. There's a river that flows out of it. All these other great things are happening. There's gold there. Um, I can't write anymore. Ugh. Okay, so darn it. It's going to be disappearing now. 
I've ordered more of these. They're coming later. Well, this one? The thing you have a stylus? I don't know this thing is, that, will that work? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if it does. Hold on. I don't know. Oh, nope. That's darn. Bad. That's right. All right. So, hmm, how can I do this so you can see it on the board? Okay. Can you kind of see? Yes. Is yeah, that able to be seen? Try this. See that? Yes. Just go. Right. You're like 20 minutes in. Come on. You're saying that I'm going too slow? No, no. Just is, that, is that what you're trying to say? That's <laughs> rude. Okay. So, mankind is made on a mountain. Okay, we're going to call this mountain Eden. This is the place where God's presence and man's presence overlap. Okay? And we're going to see that he's given a job to do. His job or his vocation. What is his vocation? Make his presence known. To make his presence known. Okay? So how? What does he do? What does man do? Bear God's image and represent God to creation. All right. Bear the image of God. Okay, so he used the word represent. Okay, so he's representing God's, who God is to the world. Okay, so, and the point of this, this image of God is he's supposed to fulfill this, this vocation through intimacy, through trust, through, through this close relationship with the creator. That's his job. All right, so you might call this an original blessing. God blesses him to be able to do this. And all of this, um, like we talk a lot about original sin, right, in Genesis 3, but we forget about how it's all starting off, that there's an original blessing, this beginning of everything. I know Josh doesn't like original sin. That's okay. We're not going to deal with that today. Um, you can do that some other time. But so how does this go over? How does this creation, this original blessing go over? It mess, he messes it all up, right? But there's this thing called sin that happens in the world. Um, and sin is basically what keeps us from our vocation, keeps us from what our responsibility is. It's what connects us to death. Okay, so heaven and hell, death and life, eschatology and protology is what we're talking. So what are we made for? Let us make man in our own image. Genesis 1, 26, maybe, right? Make man in our, and let them rule or let them be in charge of, of creation. So he created the male and female, and um, there's this diversity in there, just like there's diversity in the Trinity. And so God creates this thing, and we're going to call it, you guys remember this, it's called a tselem, which means idol. So who can, I'm sorry, I did not make enough notes for everybody. Maybe, Josh, does anybody know how to use the copy machine? Um, might be too late now. Yes. All right. Sorry. Um, yeah. So who can make images? Who can make idols? Right? We aren't allowed to. That's part of our commands. We aren't allowed to make idols, but God can make idols. So he makes an idol. We call this idol Adam, man. Okay. That we've done all this before. So if you're new and you're not catching on to all this, this is the word icon, or it just means his image, the representative that he has there. Okay, so he has this particular image, man, that's going to represent him well, or is going to rule on his behalf here in the world. Remember that humans are different than animals. Humans are meant to rule over the animals. Now, we have a lot of similarities, right? We both go to the dirt the same way. We both um, have are breathed into life in a similar way. But there's some different things going on here. The big difference is that word vocation. Okay, we have a calling to represent the creator, a unique vocation. And if we don't do this, if we allow the animal life or other things to come up above us, right, then all of creation is off kilter. Everything's a mess from then on. So the question is, and here's a good little application question for all of us, right? Are we going to live according to our purpose, according to our design? or contrary to it. 
How are we going to live? What do we want to do? Are we going to follow the path that God has given us? Or are we going to go off, off the path? So when we decide to go off the path, when we decide not to follow this one, right? This God who has called us in a certain way, we have a word for that. It's called hell. Okay, so that's what I want you to think of when you think of hell. It is lack of vocation. Sin is when you're not following the vocation that you've been given. Okay, so living in sin is the path of hell. This is the direction that we're going. So God forms man from the dust of the ground. He breathes life into him. Genesis chapter 2. Okay, and he becomes a living being. And the Lord God planted man took him and put him in the garden of Eden, okay, which is a, a sacred place within Eden. Eden is a sacred place, but then there's a more sacred place in the actual garden. Okay, so this is, this is where man is, and this is where he's supposed to rule. Um, all right, so okay. this Genesis is just another take on how humanity is, Genesis 2 and Genesis 1 are just two different takes on how humanity is set up to rule, how, how they're supposed to do this. So God is molding Right. I don't know if when you were growing up, you ever saw like if you had one of those picture Bibles with God, like molding the clay. It was always a little creepy, like these huge hands and stuff like that. So I, I wrote in there, like, what is the word anthropomorphism mean? Most of you probably know that some of you are teachers in here, but this is just the way that we describe God. Right. It's a way of giving God uh, human attributes, which he does not have. So he has hands. Or he breathes into people. Okay, so just use that word all the time um, in your parties and things like that. Wherever you're going, just if you want to be cool, use anthropomorphism. It's one of your big words. All right. We have a, we have a question. Uh, okay. Wasn't uh, from Rick, wasn't the garden special or holy because of God's presence? Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say. That's what makes this. I, I would rather say it differently. I would say it's not that the garden was holy because of God's presence. It was that the garden is the presence of God and therefore it's holy. So like this is a, the garden is a metaphor for this place where God dwells, where God and man can work together. Absolutely. So it's hundred percent holy. But the point of it, of course, is for Adam to rule over all. So the garden is supposed to expand. It's supposed to continue to get larger and larger because of his representation in the world. So, but the problem is that he's going to leave this, right? He's going to choose his own path, which we'll get to in just a second. All right. So um, God being described in human words is what I was talking about. So Moses sees God's back, for instance. Um, uh, Where's some other ones? Uh, what is, what are we, uh, we're told that God has like feathers that he puts over people um it, it's basically us trying to figure out how to use the language right we like we have no way of describing god so we just make up stuff that, that makes sense to us how we can see it um ezekiel ezekiel sees god like a there's a chariot a, a lion and an ox and eyes and wheels and all this weird stuff that's the way he defines how he sees god Isaiah 6 is, yeah, like a king, right? Yeah. Lofty and exalted and the whole train of his robe filling the temple. That, that concept of a train filling the temple is impossible, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's a way to, to explain him. So humans come from the dirt, okay? This is a way that we explain where we come from, okay? Um, so that's why we're called earthlings, right? Because we come from the earth. Uh, or Adam comes from Adama. Adam is the word for human. Adama is the word for ground. Okay, earth. So man comes out of earth. So, but they're not just that, right? It's not just this molding together of whatever this man looks like. Okay? You're not made out of dirt, right? This is just a concept that we have. It's, that it's a way to make us think about this. But there's more. There's also the breath of God. So God breathed, right, into everyone. We are dirt and we're breath combined. So that's when we get into this idea of a soul. You can see how this protology is very important to eschatology. What's going to happen when we die? I want to know where I'm going to be. Am I going to be in heaven? Am I some immortal soul? Am I just some ethereal presence? You, we see it in pictures all the time, right? Cartoons where they're just something when they die, they something floats away. 
Um, some of you may have seen this cartoons, movies, whatever the case is, we just this something, this other presence there. Um, so uh, the King James says that he became a living soul, okay, or a living nefesh. So does our soul continue on after death or does our spirit continue on after death? The, do humans have this non-physical part of us that's meant to forever live, um, to, to live there? See, we, we, we have this dualistic concept in our minds of body and spirit, and the body is somehow, well, we've, some people have said, is the prison house of the soul. That the soul is just, you know, this is where the body is. When the body dies, then the soul is kind of just floating around, or maybe it goes to heaven, or whatever it's happening. These, these concepts are in the Bible a little bit, but they're not quite what we think they are. So this breath isn't, this spirit that is in us isn't ours, right? It's God's. God is the one who breathes life into us. So there's the spark of life that comes from God. God is the one who animates us. That's all this means. So that word for spirit is important. It's the ruach. Okay, so the Ruach, the spirit of God, indwells us. It is also the same word that's used for breath and for wind. Okay, so this concept, this idea that God breathes into us, the Holy Spirit, right, the Ruach comes into us. And this is true for animals, um, mankind, whatever. We're a living soul, a nefesh. And what we do is we import this Greek philosophical idea of an immortal, non-physical idea that lives forever. But Genesis isn't talking about that, okay? Um, this nephesh is, is not some ethereal, like, what I'm trying to say is we don't have a soul that we lose. We are a soul, okay? You are, and soul and spirit, we're just using interchangeably right now. You can get into the New Testament and maybe if you want to try and start differentiating between the two, is fine, but right now we're just talking about these two parts, that is your physical makeup and that which animates your physical makeup. And they're meant to be together, okay? They're, they have to be together. So the whole point of all of this is that we're waiting not for some cool heaven place, but we're waiting for some cool resurrection place. And those are different. Resurrection and heaven are different. And you can only see this in Genesis. This, or not only see it in Genesis, but if you follow this trajectory, right? We're not waiting for heaven. We're waiting for resurrection. So heaven is this, this parenthesis spot in between, maybe, the way that we are thinking about it, okay? An intermediate state, which we're going to get to right in a, in a second. But this, this nefesh, this soul, is, is the breath of God that animates all of us. Uh, nefesh actually means throat, by the way case anyone cares about such things. It means throat. Um, Bruce Walke used to say it means appetite. It's, it's that longing for something. Um, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my nefesh pants for you, right? This isn't some immaterial part of us that is like panting. But it's, it's a way of saying that we as people that are animated by the spirit are longing after God. Okay, so throat or appetite living individual, not a separate, indestructible, spiritual substance. Humans don't have souls. They are souls. And we used to talk like this all the time, right? How many people were lost on the ship? We lost 17 souls, right? I, you're like, right, I mean, lose the souls. The souls are going to heaven, right? No, it's their life, lives. It's these people who are alive. So uh, I'm going to skip some stuff because Travis said that I was running out of time already, 25 minutes or whatever. Okay. So here at 8.30. Good. All right. So death comes from sin. Sin is which, what leads us to hell. Okay. Don't think of hell like fire. Don't think of hell as darkness. Think of hell as the movement from here to here. Can anybody see that? I don't know if you can actually see what I'm doing. Well, people in my room can. So, all right. So that, that's what's happening when hell. These, these, the sin brings in this unnecessary schism, which is death. Death is 
the absence of life. That's really brilliant, isn't it? You guys are all like, thank you for that. This is all coming together. I promise you it's all starting to, it's gonna to start to come together. So we're not made to exist apart from our bodies, okay? Our bodies are what's important here. So those of you guys don't like your bodies, sorry. Like this is what God's given you, it's awesome. Okay, you're supposed to actually like your bodies. It's a good thing. So we're made for resurrection, not for heaven. We're made for living life, not living death. So we can think about zombies, right? That's what's happened here. These living, these living death bodies are there. Okay, so, um, so in the New Testament, when we get to that, we're going to see like Ephesians chapter 2 where we are dead in trespasses and sins, which we formerly walked and lived, like this living death kind of idea. That's what happens after you leave here. All right, I'm got, I gotta do, I gotta do a better job. Okay. Because I feel like I know what I'm talking about, but I can, I can tell that I'm just talking in, in big, vague cert- uncertainties. Okay, so here is mankind. Mankind is left with a choice. Which direction is he going to go? Right? Okay. If he chooses the right path, then he will, these two worlds will work together. He will be able to stay in the presence of God some of this time. What he does instead is chooses to walk down here. Okay. This is the choice that he's given. He chooses death over life. Right? This is the promise. This is what God says. If you choose this, you will have death. So now he is outside of the presence of God. Now, the, what he wants to do is he wants to grab hold of this and pull it back down to him or pull himself up. And this is our goal throughout is to reach back in and get Eden again. Okay? And the way we do this is through our vocation. Does that make sense? We do this by representing God well in the world. Then we move up higher on this, on this plane, at least in my picture right here. Okay. So physical death was not the plan for anything. That's this, that, that's something that's jumped in and gotten in the way. Okay. That, that's a mistake. So like Ecclesiastes 12, um, I have it here. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the youth, I'm sorry, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, the keepers of the house tremble, strong men stoop. Basically, he's going to go through this long list of before you get old, right? Remember the day of your creator before you get old, when people are afraid of heights and danger in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Okay, so when the spirit returns to God who made it, this is what's happening. So our spirit is going back to the spirit. So Ruach, we're no longer animated. Okay, so physical death, not good. Humanity, like not for us. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't, that's not something that's natural. That's a mess up and everything. Job 34, if God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. Okay, is it our spirit that we're talking about here or God's spirit? This is God's spirit that goes back to him. All right, so we're not made to live forever. We aren't immortal. That This is all a gift of God that we get. Okay, that's the tree of life and all that stuff. That's why we're banned from the tree of life. I've yeah. got a couple of questions, thoughts. All right. You, is this a good spot or you want to keep going for a Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, so first one was like the pulling the circle back down or getting back into it. Comment thought was the only way that we can please God is if we are in Christ as a, in the discussion of works versus grace. And then uh, that was it from Rick. And then Josh also put a question out. How do we maintain the omnipresence of God with the idea that we can choose to exit the present? Oh, fantastic. Okay. So the first question I'm going to put off, because that's kind of the point, that's where we're going, right? We haven't made it to Jesus yet, but that's, that's always my goal here, is to make it to Jesus. There is no way for us to get up, to pull down heaven. There's no way to do that. That's part of the problem, right? So I think you said Rick said that, which is absolutely right. We, we, we need someone else who is 
I mean, this is where we're gonna to get to, right? We're gonna to get to this cross. And we're gonna say that this is, this is where it overlaps. So all along we had Eden, we had tabernacles. This is all what we talked about earlier, temples, right? These are all the different places where God dwells with mankind, where he makes things, where he connects to them. But there's just one spot, there's just his presence. Now there are other spots, of course, right? Jacob uh, says, you know, this is surely the place that God dwells when he sees the stairs come down or Jacob's ladder, we might call it. Um, Moses, the burning bush is a place that God and mankind connect. Remember, he's up on a mountain. Again, these holy places, all of that's happening. But the problem is that we can't ever get back to this. We can only sometimes jump into it because, because God gives us this holy place. But the goal is for us to constantly be walking in it. And the goal of this whole Bible study, I can just say this in case you're missing the whole thing, right? Is that through resurrection, this is my big point, through resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, and therefore ours, he's the first fruits of the re resurrection. Through his resurrection, we actually can live in the heavenlies now. That's the big point that I'm trying to get across here. Okay, so if you forget everything else, we aren't waiting to get to heaven. We already have access. We're already supposed to be living there. Okay, and I've got a bunch of verses that we're going to eventually get to if we get to it in time. So, because I'm totally off of my paper now anyway. All right. The already and the not. Yeah. Yes. I see that. Kate. Exactly. So we are already there, but not fully there. Life after life after death. We're, well, that's, yeah, that's what we're ultimately looking for, right? We ask this question, what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen after death? That's not really the ultimate question. That's not the question that everyone is talking about in the Bible. They're talking about life after life after death, as Tom Wright says. Does that make sense? Life after life after death. So that intermediate state that we have in the middle there, like what's happening during that time, we can talk about that if you want to. But the big question is what's happening after, you know, this like the big question is what's happening now and how it connects to after like this stretching of eternity so i want to call us to live heaven now that's where we're getting to all of, and all of this stuff Josh okay, is so the omnipresent the omnipresence uh remind me what that was oh how do we live in the how do we live with god in the omnipresent well i think i've kind of i've tr tried to do that we can say that god is everywhere that's not a problem, the omnipresence of God, and yet that there is a special, um, there's a special presence of God for those who walk with him. That's always been the case. He's always been everywhere, right? There's nowhere we can flee from his presence. We can't run a hide and all that stuff, but we are, we are hoping, uh, we are expecting to come into some kind of connection, the favorable presence of God. I saw Josh had something else. What did you say? So then is salvation more so an awareness that everything belongs, that God is always present and that we just need the eyes to see, or perhaps that's just an aspect? <laughs> Joe, Josh. Uh, you, you have to read it again. I'm sorry. Uh, Josh, you just want to unmute yourself? Or? Yeah, I mean, it just, I'm wondering, I'm wondering then if, it, to an extent, I mean, I don't mean in its, in its totality, but so then to an extent, when we talk about salvation, is part of what we mean by that an awareness of what you're talking about, this, this overlap of heaven and earth, that God yeah. is, is present in the here and now. And like Moses, you know, Moses took off his shoes because he was on holy ground. But it's not that the ground somehow magically became holy, but more so the ground was already holy and Moses had an awareness. His eyes were opened. And that, that's kind of how I would think about the burning bush as well. So my question then is like, when we talk about salvation, is that somehow an aspect of that? Like a, a seeing of this reality that you're describing, the overlap of the two? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that's how I would define salvation. Yeah, I think that's a great way of explaining it. So we, it's being able to see into this other realm and knowing that we can live in it now. All right, so that's... That's, that's how we're being saved. So I've often called it like a scrim theology. So scrim is, um, those of you acting people in there, I know Davin's in there somewhere, but I can't see him, right? This, this idea that there's a, a, 
a curtain that's behind you that you it looks like that's the end of the stage but then when a light shines on the curtain you can see through it into what's happening in the background and there's usually people dancing or singing in the back of that you can see right through this curtain it's a very very thin curtain and that's how the irish used to talk about it. the celtic way of talking about it was a, a thinned curtain see being able to see into that other world and live in that other world now okay so Almost like the veil is torn back, right? The veil that you can see God face to face. Yeah, so that's a that's a veil that's been ripped open and we can actually go into that presence. Yeah, that's, that's all looking at the same idea. The problem is that we've forgotten that. So we, we have forgotten our vocation. And so we've chosen to go down here where the animals are. And what we should be doing is trying to figure out how to get back up here. And obviously the answer is the cross, right? That's the only way this is going to happen. So we, yeah, we are looking, we're aware of God's presence in the world. So I like the way that Josh put all that. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, we will be known as we are known. That's good. Let's see here. I'm looking at the time, 543. See, I, I'm, I've now gone in so many different places that this, this almost has no use to me anymore. Um, so what does it look like? So when we're living in the presence, right? It should look somewhat different than the world or the non-presence. Yeah. And so I think that's the that's the, the, the deciding factor is how do you know someone's walking in the presence of, of God? They're probably not going to look like someone who's walking in the presence uh, in the world, right? Um, someone who's not in the presence of God. I think Josh's question was how is... If God is in everything, as from Richard Rohr, Rohr and is, and is everywhere, how are we not in the presence of God? And it's by acknowledging that God is there. And I think, Josh, if you can hear me, uh, what separates us from all other animals, I think, is the actual, the actual ability to think that there is or might be a God. I don't see my cat questioning the existence of God. You know, I just don't see that. Con didn't contemplate Maybe they do, but um, I don't know if that that, um, that helps at all, but it, I'm trying to grapple with that same question as Josh is asking, you know, what what does it look like? And uh, yeah, we're walk I have a quote real quick, and I want to say this. He was a walking blasphemy, half ape, half angel. However, man is neither animal nor angel. And the pity of it is that in trying to act the angel, usually only behaves like an animal. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Good quote. If yeah, you're looking for right. Did you all hear that? Yes. Okay, good. If, I can hear him just fine, so I'm not sure if you can. If but you're looking you for a tie-in point back to your outline, page two, the gospel is not about keeping you from hell. It's about reminding you what you are made for and maybe start from there, you know. <laughs> okay let's see where is I think, that i think it's page two anyway uh, the page that starts with what is a soul yeah, it's, it's not page two for me though you know so sure let's see here um the gospel is not keeping you from hell it's about reminding you what you're made for okay yeah we'll just skip those few pages that's all right yeah because I, I only have 15 minutes so <laughs> let's just do that it seems like this um, is where we're at, maybe i don't know yeah, I'm sure I'll back up and find other, other stuff in here, but that's all right. Uh, all I was saying there is that Paul doesn't wield, when we get to Paul, for instance, in the New Testament, see, there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't say about the New Testament here. Um, maybe I need to back up. Because um, we I, I never really jumped into Jesus in this whole thing. So. Go for it. We like to yeah, I know, I know. I'm just trying to figure out where to. Um, so Hebrews says that Jesus, in, in times past, they spoke through the prophets, right? Remember all that and through the fathers. But now they speak, he speaks only through his son. Um, the exact representation of his glory, Hebrews is going to say, the true image of God. So that's where we got all that son of man language from before Daniel 7. So again, if you haven't been here the last four or five weeks, you've missed out on Daniel 7 and how all that connects and how the son, animal and the sons of man work. Uh, but so I'm just trying to bring everything together. So how does God deal with the problem of death, of our 
of our rejection, of our moving away from um, the presence of God? What is he going to do about that? He's going to, of course, become mankind, right? He's going to become just like Adam. He's going to become a, a human. And he's going to defeat death and the fear of dying and because that's not what he wanted to begin with. So, gosh, this is such a disaster now. I'm sorry, guys. It's a beautiful disaster. I don't think it's that beautiful of a disaster. Um, yeah. Hmm. It's in such a mess. Uh, okay, so we're I... in utter tohu vabohu. We get that. But I think yeah. <laughs> what Rick was saying is really valid. Like you, you have like, so if you look at it as a dichotomy, right? Instead of as a omnipresence. So Josh, I agree with you. Like, if, and I know this is backwards. So if God is, is here, the center of God is here. We have a choice to walk to the center or walk away. Now God's still here. God's omnipresent, but what are, which direction are we facing this way? We're going toward God, toward heaven. This way we're feeling pain because we're walking away from what's good. We're walking into hell. And there's something that Rick was saying about no matter how much we try to, to turn with our vocation toward God, our vocation can't get us there alone. We can't, we can't get to God on our own. And that's what he was pointing out. That's where somewhere Jesus comes into this play because we can't do it. No matter how far we walk, how hard we go, how much vocation we want to put into this, we can't get there on our own. So how does Jesus get us from this broken place where we can't ever reach high enough, we can't do enough, we can't be enough. From this lost place, we can't find the garden, we can't get back to the temple, we can't get back to that holy place. How does Jesus get us back there? All right, and the answer is resurrection. Right? That's what it all comes down to. That's where I've been trying to lead this whole thing to is we're all waiting for this great resurrection, which is the end time plan right? This is when Jesus comes to Lazarus, Lazarus uh, Mary and Martha about Lazarus. They say, we know that he's going to be resurrected in the end, right? And he's saying, no, 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 no. You're missing something. There's going to be a pre-resurrection. Everything else is going to, there's something different that you're missing. You're missing this intermediate time. So on this, on this long thing that we're doing here, and across, so here we've got the mountain, we've got Adam up on the mountain, he chooses to go down, we have this and this, but here we're going to find that completely in both sides, but now this is the inauguration of his coming, his kingship, right, this is where he resurrects, and then here's us, we're constantly trying to figure out which direction we're going to go, we're going to go here, we're going to go here, Okay, so during this continuation, but what we forget is that we have already been resurrected. We're not waiting for the final consummation. This is, this is Paul's idea is that this, this has been stretched over a long period of time. So this is where Jerusalem, where the new Jerusalem comes down to earth, right? But here is where we're making this choice constantly to live the resurrected life or to live in hell. So it's going to be life abundant or hell or life without God or life without recognition of God or the favorable presence of God. However, you want to understand those different things, but it's all about our resurrection and we have already been resurrected. This is not something we're simply waiting for. So um, John says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, right? has eternal life he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life very truly i tell you a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live it's already present we're not simply waiting for something else resurrection is for everybody verse 28 uh john 5 what i was talking about do not be amazed at this for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will come up right this is what we're waiting for John 17, I'm sorry, this is what we are already experiencing. Uh, the time has come, Father. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. You have granted him authority over all people. This is eternal life, not going on clouds and harps and things like that. 
to know that you are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You know God through knowing Jesus Christ is the point here. And which is all that Rick said early on. And I should have just stayed with that instead of continuing in my own direction here. Colossians says, for he, Jesus, has rescued us from dominion of darkness, and we have been brought into the kingdom of the sun. Remember, it's all about vocation. It's all about kingdoms. It's all about the different kingdoms that we're going to choose to be in. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about choosing this abundant life or choosing, choosing this other direction. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but because of his great love for us, he made us alive in Christ, seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. That's not a future thing, seated in the heavenly realms. Christians, you are presently seated in the heavenly realms. Yeah. Okay, I can say this from my, uh, my own experience, that I was living in hell, a living hell. Yeah. And so my definition or my answer to a couple of the questions was, or is, is that uh, when I experienced the grace, when I was aware of the gratuitous grace that, that God gives to those who find him, he doesn't make it difficult. He says, knock and the door shall be answered, seek and you shall find. And so what happens when I surrender, it's my salvation is not, I'm not worried about some afterlife thing. It's happened in my life. Like I've been re resurrected a new creation. And so and I've, I've changed the trajectory of my life. And so I think C.S. Lewis talks about that. The best testimony for the existence of God is someone's uh, changed life, changed life yeah. you know? And so I think we see it time and time again. I think people grapple with God and the, and the conception of, of hell. And because it's been, I mean, can, my question, I guess, to you is what are the things that you've seen that have misconstrued our perception of hell? Like, is there something in particular that in the past um, was um, that stands out like Dante's Inferno or, you know, um, but something else that I'm not aware of. Sure. And all the metaphors that scripture itself, right? I, these ideas aren't simply coming from our mythical backgrounds. They're coming from, they're coming from the Bible itself. There are, there are passages in the Bible that talk about fire. There talks about death. There talks about darkness. Um, and they use these metaphors in different ways, right? Obviously, you're not going to have a fiery, dark place. Those two ideas can't exist together, at least not in the way we understand them. But these are, this is the way that we live. This is, um, I'm sorry, it's the way that we understand things. Like, when, even Jesus, when he talks about hell, this is just a place, right? This is, um, this is Ginnom. This is the, uh, the place right outside of the walls of Jerusalem. It's a, it's a trash heap. It's a place where Ahaz, the king, uh, did detestable things. The life that they lived there, probably child sacrifice and stuff like that. Those are the things that took place there. So this is life lived outside of God's favor. That's what hell is. So I don't know if I answered that yeah, question. You Thank you. Thank you but very much. yeah, and I think the way that we could see hell is by looking at where we used to be and where we are for some of us, right? Or if it's not for some of you, if you can't see that huge difference, just think about anybody whose marriage was in trouble and then somehow... God did something. He resurrected it. And you can see how, how God is moving, how he can bring you into that other place. Um, and then some of you didn't get it resurrected, right? And you lived in hell and you're trying to figure out, you're fighting for getting that back. You're trying to remember that the resurrected life means that you are, that you have that vocation, that representative. You have become an, you've always been the image of God, but you're taking the image of God again seriously. You're starting over again. Okay, you've been resurrected. Does that make sense? At least a little bit of it? Okay. Because, yeah, this is all. Go ahead and ask questions because at this point, I've got like 10 more pages and I, I, I'll never get back to this. So <laughs> I spent all day working on it, but I've got a lot of cool verses in here. Talk about Sheol and Hades and where all this stuff comes from, but it's probably not the best use of our time, to be honest. So I'm going to stop. I never stop on time. So I'm going to stop on time this time, which is supposed to be 15 minutes before. So I'm, I'm, I'm 19 minutes before this time. So that's good. We've got uh, a couple comments from Rick about uh, good. referring to Romans, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, Paul tells us. Uh, I was thinking about Romans a little myself. He also talks about, I don't mean to nitpick, however, Jesus changes the trajectory of our lives if we allow him to. 
Um, and then Josh said that some of the confusion can come maybe with conflating eternal life versus everlasting life. Um, no, Josh, you're going to have to tell us somewhere about that. Um, so I think this, like, this was a big thing for me, at least when it was pointed out to me, it kind of helped me wrap my mind around the paradigm of this living in the already, not yet. When we talk about eternal life, eternal is outside of the bounds of time. But when we say everlasting, everlasting by definition is within the confines of time because you're using time to justify or to explain a duration, an everlasting period of time forever. Eternal is outside of that. Eternal is not confined to what we understand as time, which is why God is so confusing because God is eternal, which is why I can be an open theist and still be a Christian. Um, and so <laughs> it's a part of it. You can't, but that's all right. But, <laughs> and so, so it's, it's an acknowledgement. If we think that the whole point is everlasting life, living forever, um, which if you think that's a good idea, go watch The Good Place. It's a great show. And then tell me what you think about living forever. Um, eternal, to me, it's, it's, it's a, a way of being. It's, a, um, it's a, a way of holding oneself. It's a, it's a quality of life versus quantity. It's, it's a life lived within the presence and fully partnering with God compared to not. So like eternal life is more of a quality, a way of being in the world, an acceptance of reality, whereas everlasting is just this idea that we get to live forever in the clouds. So like I think confu for me, that was like when I heard that, I was like, oh, my goodness, I understand. Like there's a, there's a difference there. I don't, yeah. know what it means, I don't know what it means to live forever, but I can somewhat wrap my mind around what it means to live a life that is uh, um, permeated with the presence of God that reflects the character of God and that looks like Jesus and how that's somehow better than living a life that's not. I can get my mind around that. All right, so what you've done is you've that taken two, two English words and used them in a differentiation for a reason to make up, because the word can be translated either way. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, just a Greek word, it just means right. forever. But it also means like abundance, like the state of being. Is that that's what you're trying to get at there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't I, have to I, do with chronology necessarily. It has to do with the state of being that you're in. Yeah, and I think the state of being is like what kind of like blew it open for me. I was like, ah, yes, that's something that makes sense. Jesus is present here and now and has a genuine influence on my life and what it means to be a human being. Versus one day when I die, it's going to be really nice. I can, you know, live in the clouds and, you know, play golf with Jesus or something like that. Josh, yeah. would you say that that ties back into what Jace was saying with we are resurrected now? Yeah, like absolutely. Like your state of being eternal is the state of understanding that we are now resurrected. We're not waiting for the resurrection. Yeah, no. absolutely. I think so. Okay, can I add to that? Marx, Marx, uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche were, their main criticism, con constructive or not, against Christianity that, that they saw in, in what the late 19th century was that it was a form of escapism and that people were go going to, to be going to church to become a part of a club and that they were saved you're not so it's it's um, not only and that they're going to heaven and the other person's not so it was a form of escapism when really what the gospel is calling us to do is live in the eternity of, of ne eternal now right and the eternal now means what does that look like? And I think, Josh, I get what you're saying about, um, about that in particular. Now, I'm not sure. I've never heard of that term. Uh, um, what did he say he, he claimed to be? Uh, well, <laughs> he claimed to be a, a, that, that doesn't matter. We're, we're, not, we're not listening to him and his views on that kind of stuff. Open, <laughs> an open theist or open and Open theist. Okay. Or like, that's maybe, uh, is he smiling? Yes. Yes. Like esoteric he, he and I truths. fight about this all the time. So esoteric yeah. truths, right? <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with perennial philosophy, esoteric truths, and, and things like that. Meister Eckhart. Take but me it, somewhere to with it. Yeah, anyways, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the, um, the eternal now is, is heaven on earth, right? Is, is, that's kind of what the whole point of it is, right? I mean, yeah. that's resurrected now. 
And to, I don't really think about hell. And I don't know if I'm limited. My question is this Should we as Christians be thinking about hell? And after afterlife, like to, torment? Is that something that we should even be thinking about? That's a great question. What do you guys say? What's the Bible say about eternal consciousness on them? It doesn't. It doesn't say. I'll, I'll stop so I don't get kicked out of this cool group. <laughs> you won't get kicked out. No, I mean, I think that that's, I think that's fair. Uh, it doesn't talk a lot about that, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, first of all, most of the time that it's talking about something, it's talking about the presence of, of hell that we're constantly living in now. But there are a few passages that do talk about eternal, but remember, we've just talked about eternal punishment or the fires going up forever and ever but that doesn't mean necessarily that we are tortured for that amount of time. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of different views and we could go a lot of different directions. We could go into, I think, I'm pretty sure that Josh is an annihilationist, but heading into right, your conditional immortality. No, I, I don't know. I, that, okay. I, that question used to interest me, but it, ah, very good. That's what I would say. It used yeah. to interest me. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That's how I would answer it. So so anyway, there's lots of different views of hell. Should we be talking about it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, com it's a concept that is interesting. But I, what I want to get is I want to try and connect the protology to the eschatology, right? I want us to see that the whole goal is to get back to the mountain, is to get back to that presence of God, right? Or to get back to that resurrected state. We can't do it on our own. That's why we need someone to come and resurrect, you know, the first fruits of resurrection. We need Jesus to be able to do that. But all of it has been about spreading the mountain, spreading this holy place of God, wherever we're at. So that, that comes in vocation through resurrection. So you've been resurrected. You now have a position. You have a, a, a role of representing God in the world. So everywhere you go, you make little houses of God. You're little resurrection beings where everybody sees who you are. So whatever you're doing in the world, whatever your vocation is, your ultimate vocation is representing him in that particular place, right? So yeah, we're not talking about what's going to happen after life, you know, after, after we die. We're talking about what's happening presently. And honestly, most of Revelation is about that as well. So we think about the book of Revelation as being something that's all talk, taking place in the future, but there's very little that's talking about something that's later. Is this the so, prelude for next week? Yes. Yeah, so next week, next week, Dr. Dalrymple and I are going to talk about uh, Daniel 7 specifically and Revelation 21 and 22 and how this fits into the protology that we started here that I did a terrible job in keeping organized, but in my head is right. <laughs> so, yeah. We have lots of good questions and participation. Yes, that's right. So we need to do that more often too. So usually it's me talking the whole time. So this was much better to hear from other people. And especially we got some smart people on this group too. Some of you smart people didn't talk at all, but you can well, in the future. I, I do have a question about downloading the notes. Uh -huh. Is there a place to download the notes? There's a Facebook group uh, or Facebook page, not a group. I put it in the chat. I'll send it again so it's at the bottom of the chat. If you like our Facebook page, the notes are posted on there, usually as an image because that's what Facebook requires you to post. Um, so. Okay, I was on the Facebook page. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I was on the Facebook page today for about an hour looking around. <laughs> they, were, they were posted super late today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I was literally working on this till about 30 minutes before we started. So okay. yeah. that's, that's half of the disorganization and stuff. Oh, thank you. So Travis it's was like, cool. oh yeah, I should probably post that. <laughs> Jay, so when you're saying the word resurrection, are you talking about like born again? Is that the, okay. Yep. Yeah. Bap baptism, right? We're, we die in Christ and we're resurrected in him to new life. So when we get new life, yeah, we are living in this heavenly world now. And so this is like, well, you know, I sin a lot, but you don't have to, right? You have, you have the ability to live in this world of heaven now. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No, that's not what I'm, I'm not arguing holiness doctrine or anything like that. I'm just saying we actually can follow God in his vocation, representing him well. 
It's not something that we can just say, well, we're depraved sinners and stuff like that. No, we've been resurrected. We have new life. All right, I'm done. You guys ready to go? I'm tired. I've got lots more questions, but they'll take way too long. <laughs> I mean, you, you can ask more questions for another five minutes if you want. <laughs> ask another question, Travis. We want to hear it. So how, 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 like, we can choose, but like, how do you factor in something like Romans 6, where it talks about the, yes, you can choose, but I want to choose this, but I still choose the other, my old self, my new self, and how they fight with each other and that whole dichotomy. Yeah, well, that's Romans 7. We dealt with that last week, like, for a long time. Oh, well, I guess I'm still... We were there for that. Yeah. We talked about... I mean, that's... that's. Remember, that's Israel having that fight with itself, right? Whether they will follow or whether they won't. But... And, and that's why we've kind of... We kind of take it on ourselves. But... So it is, it is a constant battle that we have, I think. That's a fair thing to say. Right? Yeah. Like Rick says, we still have to battle with the old nature. It's still there. But if we just say, well, we still are sinners and we still have that old nature, then I think we're missing the value of the resurrection, that it's not fire insurance for the future. It's something, it's a way that we can live currently. That eternal life begins now. Yeah. Which, would you, which, would you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Would you say that? Would that... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You had talked about the uh, the animal wanting to wanting last or the week before last. You talked about the animal wanting to take over or wanting to be. It. Yeah. Now, are we as representatives resurrected, um, made in God's image? Are we battling the inner reptilian brain? You know that 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 fight or flight that that part of us that wants to go back to our animal nature. And this is just a question, you know. Yeah, this was last week too, right? Yeah. This dark, this Star Wars, you know, we cut off our own, we're fighting with ourselves. Were you there last week? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So it's all about fighting with our own, with our own nature and trying to win, for sure. C.S. Lewis made that argument. What? Say yeah, it. that's, that's C.S. Lewis's whole thing. Like, if you look at the Chronicles of Narnia, you have these beasts, these animals that have human-like qualities, but it's because they have stepped away from their vocation as what it meant to be human, and they have devolved right. rather than evolved and so that's lewis's understanding of or at least one of his he gives like a million interpretations of hell but that's one of them is this we we lose what it means to be human to be human is to look like jesus and sin keeps us from that and so we revolt back into this animal-like state yeah which is why this is the picture to, yeah this is the picture of nebuchadnezzar and daniel right this devolution and that's that's what people would say hell is, right? Hell is when you've reached that spot, when you've devolved so far, and then, you know, it's it's not even, I think that's what Tom Wright talks about. Like hell is reserved for those people who've devolved, they become subhuman, they become less than human. Yeah, and he steals a lot of that from Lewis. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And Narnia is a great picture of that for sure. I'll so hopefully- I'll download our recording of last week and put it up either tonight or tomorrow, everybody. I don't think it's been posted yet. In case anybody wants to go watch it. Yeah, that one, that'll be much more helpful to all of this if we watch that. And certainly by the time we talk with Rob, Dr. Dalrymple next week. Yep. All right. I'm going to sign off 6.15 uh, in my time. 9.15 years, I think.